Good evening. Let's turn to song number 81. Number 81, God of our strength. Welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, this is our third evening now of uh, Winter Bible School, and looking forward to another evening of hearing Wendell he will share with us. Uh, tonight's topic, or his, what he's gonna be talking about is men and women's hairstyles, and the beard and the mustache. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing about that. Let's begin with prayer. Jesus, we invite you here. We want to learn more about what it means to be your holy people and how to live in a way that brings you glory. And I pray that you would bless our time together, and I just pray that you would give us a lot of discernment and understanding and help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. Pray also for your um, anointing on Wendell as he shares. In Jesus' name, amen. So for a short devotional, just to get our thoughts, um, cooking, I guess. I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Peter 2, and if you were paying attention, um, you'll know that this has come up at least once already. Uh, Wendell brought this passage up in the last uh, few messages. Um, 
But I, I just wanted to take a little more time to like a little focused um, uh, thought on this passage because I, I think it's foundational. And I don't, I don't know what you uh, think about, but whenever we have any kind of practice that we've done for years and years and maybe even centuries, then it seems like it would be beneficial to take some time to just kind of think about where we're at and why and, and compare it with scripture. Um, to make sure that we're not doing like what Wendell mentioned last night, that we turn the commands of men into something that violates God's commands. So uh, that is why I wanted to just take a little time to just think about this. Um, so I'll be reading in verse 9 here. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to take the liberty of reading this in another translation. Um, this is just the last couple of verses um, in, in CSV. I just feel like the point is even more clear. Um, and he, verse 12 here, he just says, Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will, will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. And I, I just love this passage because I think it gives us so much of a, a foundation and a bedrock that we should be, um, you know, evaluating our practices and the way we live in. Um, and if I could just kind of bring you back to verse 9, I think that kind of summarizes that. I don't know if you noticed, um, but there's, I think that there's two main ideas that he gives there, the reason. Um, so, basically, at one point, he says that we were living outside of the kingdom of God. We were, we were uh, people without mercy. And now, he, he says it in like, I don't know, four, I didn't count, four or five ways, different ways. He re-emphasized that we have been chosen. We are a new people. We are part of the people of God. Um, we are now his priesthood. Um, we are part of the holy nation. And yeah, we have a changed identity. So I think that's the, that's the first piece. We are, we are a new people. And um, we, we have now um, become holy, actually. And then the second piece is... Uh, Later on in verse 9 there, he says, so that you may proclaim the praises. And that's also repeated in verse 12, which I read the second time. Um, Peter instructs us to have such honorable conduct that the Gentiles uh, bring glory to God from our good works. Um, so I think that's the second piece of why uh, our lives are supposed to be changed, is because or, or that's the piece that should inform how we live is because God intends for our good works and our lifestyle and the way we live to bring glory to him and to point people to him. So uh, those are just some thoughts I had about as, as I evaluate who we are as Anabaptists and the things that we've come to learn and, and, and do. And yeah, I think those are foundational scriptural principles that we should be um, incorporating into our lives. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more from Wendell uh, later tonight. All right, so our format for the rest of this evening will be uh, kind of as before. I'll go ahead and invite the children up. You can come on up here. CJ Lopp will be leading out for us for the children's class. And then uh, immediately following the children's class, uh, we'll have a love offering for Wendell and we'll have a song while that's um, being lifted. And then after that, we'll turn the time directly over to Wendell and then a closing song after that. All right, so looks like we don't have a lot of children tonight, so you might just have to talk to all of us. I see more children back there. Maybe more children will come up here yet.
I love peanut M&Ms. Anybody here like peanut M&Ms? You like peanut M&Ms? Does anybody want a peanut M&M? Do you want one? Peanut M&Ms make me happy. Does it make you happy? Make you happy? Who wants a peanut M&M? Uh, Alex, right? <laughs> yep. uh, are you... Alex, what's your name? Ryan. Ryan. Uh, do you want a peanut M&M? Yeah. How long is it going to make you happy? Mm-hmm. How long are you going to be happy? Depends how many you have. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Do you want a peanut M&M? Sure. Uh, how long are you going to be happy? Probably until it's down in my stomach. Probably until it's down in your stomach. Okay. Uh, what about you, Alex? Do you want a peanut M&M? Uh, is it going to make you happy? How long are you going to be happy? <laughs> Whoever, whoever's going to be happiest the longest, I want to give it to. What about... How long are you going to be happy if I give you a peanut M&M? Is anybody here going to be happy five minutes? After all. <laughs> you said you'll be happy for until as long as in your mouth. I'll give, it, I'll give one to you then. All right. Mm. Eat it. Does it make you happy? Here, you want a peanut M&M? See if it makes you happy. You want a peanut M&M? There's not many children here, so I can give a, give a lot. Does it make you happy? Make you happy? Yeah? You want a peanut M&M? Yeah? You want one? Oh, you want one? Yeah, I'll give you one. No. No? Okay. Oh. Does it make you happy? Yeah? It's good, isn't it? Are you still happy? You're still happy? Are you going to be... Uh, if I give you another one, are you going to be happy? You said you're happy already, though. So why do I need to give you another one? You're already happy, right? So I don't need to give you another one because you're already happy. Yeah? Yeah? I love peanut m and They make me happy, too. Make me happy, too. Mm. Are you going to be happy if I... Are you, anybody, are you happy? You're all happy? You don't need another peanut M&M, right? You, do you want another one? You're already happy, though, right? The peanut M&M made you happy? So you don't need another one. You, you're good. You're already happy. Good. I mean, I'll eat another one. You'll eat another one. But you're happy already because you, you had a peanut M&M. Well, good. I'm impressed. Good. That's good. That's good. I'm glad you're happy. I'm glad you're happy. Um, you know, this is kind of how life is. A lot of things in life are kind of like peanut M&M's. Peanut M&M's, they make you happy. They make you happy. But if you want another peanut M&M, then you're not happy anymore, right? <laughs> you eat one peanut M&M, and it's good, and it's good for about as long as it's in your mouth, right? And then you're done eating it, and then you want another peanut M&M, right? Yeah. <laughs> me too. Mmm. That peanut M&M makes me happy. But now I just want another peanut M&M, because that peanut m and is all. And I just want another peanut M&M. That's why you don't eat it so fast. Oh, don't eat it so fast. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. But why, it's why all. Well, then I can eat the rest of the night. You know, <laughs> yeah. But I won't be able to. We may not have a bellyache. Oh. See, life is a lot like peanut M&M's. Nothing is ever going to make you happy. Nothing's ever going to make you happy. Did you know that? Yeah. Nothing is ever going to make you infinitely happy. <laughs> yeah. Who? Yeah. Candy's going to make you happy. For how long is it going to make you happy? The whole day. The whole day. 
Good, good. Candy will make you happy for the whole day. What about the next day? No. No. The next day you gotta eat some more candy, right? <laughs> you gotta eat some more candy the next day. Yeah. And your mom doesn't let you eat candy. <laughs> so you're never happy, right? <laughs> See, that's there's a lot of things like peanut M&Ms in life. You eat them, and it makes you happy for a little bit, and then it's gone. You know why it's gone? Because you want another peanut M&M. Because I want another peanut M&M. Because if I eat another peanut M&M, then surely I'll be happy if I eat one more, right? And then you eat another one. It mm, makes me happy for a little bit, and then it's gone. And then I want another peanut M&M, &M, and I'm not happy anymore, so I want another peanut M&M. &M. And eat it makes me happy for a little bit, and then it's gone. You know, in, in this world, nothing's going to make you happy. Forever. Nothing's going to make you forever happy. Nothing. No. 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 Because you, you, you know why? Because you eat something, or you get something, and it makes you happy for a little bit, and then... You're not happy anymore because you want more because it goes away. It goes away. Okay? But you know how it's like in heaven? In heaven, see, there's a verse in the Bible that says, at God's right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. So it's like at God's right hand, maybe there's peanut M&Ms forevermore. There's pleasures. Bro, that's bad theology. That's not true. But there's pleasures forevermore. And so when you're in heaven, it's like, you eat a peanut M&M, but the happiness you get from that peanut M&M never goes away. But on this earth, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that on this earth. And only when you recognize that there's nothing on this earth that can make you happy and stop wanting everything all the time, then maybe you can find that you're a little bit happy. There's nothing on this earth that can make you happy. And one more peanut M&M is not going to make you happy. I could ask your parents that. They, could, they would know that. All right, that's everything I have. And since there's not a lot of children, you can have, is, I think, is, you can have some peanut M&M's. No. <laughs> no? You want some peanut M&M's? How many do you want? I'll give you, give you two of them. You want two of them? All right, and then you guys can go back to your parents. And just enjoy it while you're happy, but... Okay. All right, enjoy the peanut M&M's. Mm -hmm. Let's sing song number 703. 703, pure in heart, O God. And we'll be taking the offering, and the offering goes to uh, Wendell, it's a love offering. 703, pure in heart. Uh, why don't we stand to sing?
Well, good evening to you faithful few, and uh, I've been to minister study weeks, and so it does thin out after a while when, when you have extended meetings like this, but God bless you all for your presence. Just a little trivia here before we get started. I don't live in Lancaster County, but I do live on Lancaster Street. And uh, Lancaster is a family name in our community. But I found out that when I talk to people about my address, uh, some people say Lancaster and some people say Lancaster. And so if I'm on the phone, I'm more likely to say Lancaster than Lancaster because uh, I, I found out that that's more understood. The little settlement that we live in is called Govan, G-O-V-A-N. Uh, when our son was small, he was a little, uh, you know, learning the English language or, or something, getting his bearings, and he called it Go Bus. But it's not Go Bus, it's Go Van, and that is a, is a last name as well. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> a representative in our state, and his name was Jerry Govan. Really, my, uh, about four miles away is the town where the post office is. And that town is spelled O-L-A-R, and we pronounce it Oler. And that is a girl's name. Uh, so those of you who are of childbearing age and need a fresh name for a girl, you could call her Oler. The second thing I'd like to mention is that uh, these are subjects that, you know, these particular practices that we're looking at are subjects that I've been asked to speak on. I didn't call up uh, Brother Alfie and say, hey, I hear you have a winter Bible school. Could I come and address some hot button issues? Uh, so I've, I've been asked to speak on, on these, and I'm happy to be here and, and share them with you. But it's uh, something I've been asked, asked to do. It wasn't my initiative. So this evening has been announced, we're going to talk about the matter of the development and practice of men and women's hairstyles, the beard, and the mustache. And in my way of thinking, the first four subjects we've talked about, uh, nonconformity and separation in Anabaptist history, and then the plain coat, and uh, cape dress, and hair cover, head covering styles, and then this evening's subject, uh, kind of fit together in a way that tomorrow evening's subject is kind of an outlier having to do with the way you administer water in baptism. And uh, so I don't want to scare you off from tomorrow evening. I'm just saying that these subjects are a little bit different. And so the subject material that I have for the topic is a little shorter this evening, but I would like to tie it all together. We've been looking at the trees. I'd like for us to look at the forest a little bit when we get done with with the matter of hairstyles and uh, help us to see the big picture and encourage us in applying biblical principles, even if doing so makes us stand out some from the rest of society. Now, as we get into the subject of hair, let's go to the Bible for a biblical foundation. And there's three New Testament passages that I know of that specifically talk about hair. And so the first one we looked at last night, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 6, as well as verses 14 and 15. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn, but if it be a shame, for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And then verses 14 and 15, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So this teaches that it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, and that even nature teaches us that it's dishonorable for a man to to have long hair, but long hair is a glory to woman. So the word shorn there in uh, verse 6 
means to cut or to have one's hair cut or to shear. As far as I know, that particular Greek word is not really referring to the actual length of the hair, how long the hair is, but it has, has to do with the matter of, of removing hair, of, of shaving, of, uh, of, of cutting, of shearing. And uh, then we have, in verses 14 and 15, the word, or the words, long hair. And that word, long hair, is a verb. It's a different Greek word. It means to wear one's hair long, uh, to wear long hair. And then in verse 15, the second time the word uh, uh, hair is used is the noun form of that word, and it just simply means uh, long hair. Now, this is the only place in the New Testament these words are used. So one of the words means to cut or to shear your hair. It doesn't have specific reference to how long it is, just, just the process of cutting. The other word is a verb that means to grow one's hair long. And the other is a noun form of it, which means long hair. Now, Herman writes was at one time a plain coat wearing teacher at Eastern Mennonite Seminary, and he wrote an article in the May 1986 edition of the Sword and Trumpet magazine in which he asked the question, how long is long? And he notes that as a verb, this is a statement of activity, of wearing one's hair long. In other words, it's not focused on the specific length, it is focused on a process of an activity of wearing one's hair uh, long, allowing one's hair to grow long. And so in that article, he cites six scholars that he must have consulted, and none of which are Mennonites in any way, shape, or form, and only one of whom would have had any bit feeling for biblical literalism. And uh, so, in other words, they wouldn't have been predisposed to a conservative interpretation. And so after summarizing what he must have learned from these sources about Jewish and Greek context and about Paul's predisposition to, toward, a Jewish, toward Jewish social standards, then uh, Mr. Wrights concludes, how long then is long? And he says, the evidence demands that it be spelled capital L, capital O, capital N, capital G, which seems to be just a synonym for uncut. Well, if that is the meaning of long for women, then the inverse would be true for men, and that is short would mean cut. Uh, and it doesn't actually specify in this passage how short cut hair is for, for men, but it is a matter of, of cut hair. Now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. First Timothy chapter 2, and so this is the second passage in the New Testament that talks about hair. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair, or gold or pearls or costly array. The Greek word here is a word plegma which is plaited or woven with a focus on a stylish, a stylish hairstyle. Uh, W.E. Vine says in the Vulgate, which is the Latin Bible that was used for a thousand years up to the time of the Reformation, it was translated or put together by Jerome, and then it was uh, used, it was the Bible of the Middle Ages, the Bible, it was the King James Bible of the time, uh, he said that the Vulgate signifies it as ringlets or curl or, per, or curls. Yes, curls. Now let's go to First Peter yet, chapter three, and verse three. First Peter, chapter three, verse three. Who 
Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, or of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. Now this is a different word than the word that was used in, in Timothy. Uh, this word is in ploke, and Vine describes it as, defines it as plaiting, that is, intertwining the hair in ornament. And there was another uh, Greek dictionary that adds the explanation of, of being fashionable or elaborate. And so these three passages are the foundation for cut hair for men and uncut hair for women and for non-ostentatious or non-showy hairstyles for both men and women. And I, th I think we rightfully apply the passages in Timothy and, in, and, to, and Peter to, to men as well as, as to women. Now, ostentatious uh, it means you know, having to decide to, to impress or attract notice. You know, to say, here, look at me. And so that's what, that's what we mean by an ostentatious hairstyle. That may be presumptuous to assume that conservative Anabaptists, conservative Mennonites uniformly and consistently hold to all these principles. I'm not sure what all goes on in various circles um, that, you know, in private, that, that, that is not, uh, you know, that those of us in public we, we don't see, and so I'm not quite sure what goes on. Uh, However, the, the effects of, of fashion on, on hairstyles is obvious. I mean, we see it among ourselves. Uh, and perhaps it's best described as what goes around comes around. I'll say a little something more about that uh, later. I mean, there are only so many ways you can style your hair. I mean, I don't know whether it's 100 or whether it's 15 or what, but, but after a while it makes a cycle and it comes, it comes around again. But I do believe that conservative Anabaptists do take a stand and attempt to live out the biblical directives about matters of the hair, even if there may be some shortcomings. Thank you for that. So I want to begin with uh, talking about men's hair, and then maybe when we get done with men's hair, we'll take... Uh, just stand and, and sing a verse of song before we get into the matter of, of ladies' hair. One of the interesting phenomena about Anabaptist Mennonite belief and practice concerning hair, including facial hair, is that while we generally hold to these basic principles of Scripture that, that I've brought to our attention, we have some rather contradictory practice in applying uh, those, those principles. For example, some groups require men to wear beards, other groups forbid the wearing of beards. And not to mention that sometimes some facial hair is required while at the same time requiring the removal of other facial hair. And some groups um, promote the shingled or tapered hair and other groups blocked or cut off straight. And so how did Swiss German, uh, South German Anabaptist men wear their hair? How did the how did our Anabaptist forefathers wear their hair? Well, again, as I've mentioned, there wasn't photographs back then, and so we don't have that type of evidence, and sometimes paintings were done well after a person's death, and so we don't know whether that person used their imagination or on what basis uh, they, they made those paintings. And, uh, you know, perhaps they painted Men of Simons with a hairstyle that was a hundred years later, and, and so we don't, it's, it's a, little hard, a little hard to know. But I'd like to begin with the evidence that comes through the old Amish practice. So the Amish are the traditionalists of the Anabaptist history, and so they are the ones who, who probably more nearly reflected what was happened before and continue to reflect what happened uh, you know, the style of, of 1690, when was that? Uh, the Amish, 1693. So it's more likely they represent the past. And our present practice, you know better than I, I do, but it's for men to wear their hair longer than is typical for conservative uh, Mennonites. And so how did that practice begin? 
I have here uh, an article from the Mennonite Encyclopedia, uh, written by John Umbo, I believe, and he says this, One of the rules passed at a minister's conference of the Swiss Brethren held in Strasbourg in 1568, which would have been like a hundred years before the Amish division, uh, and it was confirmed later in 1752 and at 1755, which then was after the Amish division, forbade the trimming of the hair or beard according to the worldly fashions. Since the American Old Order Amish of today still follow these literally, follow literally these rules, they wear the beard and the hair of the head according to the plainer 16th to 18th century pattern. Now this was written in 1950, so you know better than me whether there's been changes in the Amish between 1950 and now, but what he's saying was they are the traditionalists, they are conservatives, they are the ones who, who followed his ruling back in 1588 and, and going forward, and so they most nearly represent the way men combed their hair back when Anabaptism uh, began. The earliest uh, drawing of Anabaptists is a Hutterite family in 1588, which shows the man's hair bobbed at the level below his ears. A painting of a supposedly typical Swiss Mennonite preacher around 1750 uh, shows him with his hair hanging over his collar. The other pictures show men with shoulder-length hair. In North America, a folk artist drew sketches of two Mennonite preachers in York County, Pennsylvania, around mid-century uh, 1800s. One's hair is hanging on the collar, and the other is well below that. Henry Brenneman lived in Ohio. He lived from 1791 to 1866, and he was the father of two Mennonite bishops. In a picture taking, a photograph or whatever, in 1860, his mop of hair covered his ears and extended below his collar. And for whatever it's worth, Oliver Wendell Shanks' painting of a kneeling, praying Christopher Dock, I don't know if you've ever seen that, that painting or not, of 1771 is when Christopher Dock died. It shows him with shoulder length hair, and I have no idea whether Shank had any descriptive evidence on which to paint his basis painting or whether it was a figment of his own imagination. But apparently, it does have some historical reality according to the evidence that I've shown, shown to you all that men uh, of that period wore their hair uh, longer than what you do. I have uh, no reason not to accept Melvin Gingrich's conclusion that, and he says, it would appear that during a large part of the past 400, or it's actually almost 500 years now, Mennonites wore their hair fairly long, as do the old order, old order Amish, as the old order Amish still do. Now, hair uh, fashions have changed uh, over time, always changed over time here in North America. Sometimes hair was wore long uh, and bushy, at other times it was short, and of course even wigs had their had their day, and sometimes beards were in style, and sometimes it was in style to be clean shaven. I mean, that's just the nature of the game. We know that's the way it is now, and that's the way it has been in the past. A hairstyle that was dominant in the 20th century until about into the 1960s uh, had severely tapered back and, and sides with a part and longer hair on top, and that was the clean-cut look that was, that was prized by... Uh, a lot of people, at least a certain segment of, of the Mennonite, Mennonite uh, groups. And that style was dethroned in uh, general society uh, by the Beatles. I believe I was in the sixth grade in a public school when I heard a student whose mother was a school bus driver say that she wasn't going to let anybody with a Beatle haircut get onto the bus. Well, the truth of the matter is, those early Beatle haircuts looked more like an Amish haircut than, than what, you know, later on, uh, they let their hair get really long, you know, like a, like a woman's hair. But um, since that time, men and, uh, men's hairstyles have been all over the place, from gelled hair to shaved heads, and, and now a revival of that pre-Beatles look. Uh, is is in in style, and so the only thing that's pretty well missing is the 1950s ducktails. Uh, you don't see uh, 
you don't normally see those around. Uh, I only know of one person that kind of has a remnant of a, of a ducktail. But uh, Mennonites have been, we've been influenced by some of these styles. And, you know, even you as Beaches, your hairstyles have changed from when I was first introduced to Beaches. So I grew up near Harrisonburg, Virginia. And, of course, there's Beaches at, at uh, Stewart's Draft. But we were kind of insular. We were kind of, you know, we didn't really... Uh, relate backwards and forwards, but when my wife and I married, we moved to, to South Carolina, and so we were in proximity of the Calvary Fellowship, Mennonite Fellowship Church at Blackville. And so that was my first uh, introduction to, to those of, of your fellowship, and so you'll have to admit that times have changed since it was typical for, for the uh, parting hair to be parted in the, in the middle. Uh, so how do we navigate men's hairstyles? And I don't have, I don't have a, a neat answer. The Bible seems not to make much of any specific, specific uh, application regarding men's hairstyles. The Bible does not say, you know, whether it's to be tapered or blocked or it just doesn't, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say how long is too long or, you know, how short is too short or, or it, it doesn't make those specific applications and I realize that our tastes can be influenced by what they're exposed to. So I you know, I was born in 1953 and, and so the hairstyles of that time you know was uh, among Mennonites was that clean cut look where you pretty close clipped on the sides and then you know longer on on top. Well dad he he just butched it all off but but uh, at least some but he did cut it up pretty close on the side for us and that's the way his hair was cut. My mom cut my dad's hair. And I was sure glad when he started putting a comb underneath and giving me a little more hair on the side. So you won't see me with that, um, with that, uh, what do you say, revival of that close up the side haircut because I was glad to get away from that. But then, you know, so I said I was in the sixth grade when, when this boy was talking about his, his mom, uh, you know, not letting people with a beetle, beetle haircut. And so, you know, not all of us have our hair combed back before the beetle time. Some of our hair comes down. And so we are, we are uh, influenced some, but, you know, our taste, what looks, looks good, is a little bit kind of where we're at in the stage of life. And, and uh, we are influenced by that. I think we'd have to be we'd have to be honest. I mean, really, that clean-cut look was once a style, too. And so I think it's probably unrealistic for a church to freeze a particular style as the one sanctified way for men and boys to do their hair. Nevertheless, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with people following the leading edge of hairstyling, particularly a style that's that's uh that's more bizarre uh more far out and so wouldn't it be somewhat unsettling if your church leaders changed their hairstyling with the fashion that you know one day they came with with whatever and and then the next day it was skinned up to the side and abruptly stopped and then you had this long hair and, and uh you know what what really would you expect tomorrow then well i think what you should expect what we should expect not only the church leaders but for all of us is moderation, as of, well as avoiding identifying ourselves with the gods of this world, whether those gods are some cockeyed fashion, or whether it has to do with uh, heroes of popular culture, uh, or whether we're trying to represent some social movement like the hippies uh, were doing in the 60s and the 70s, uh, whether we're trying to oppress, whether we're trying to uh, attract attention, look at, look at me, uh, whether they're trying to show off, whether they're trying to make a statement, whether we're trying to identify the world. You know, we, should be, we should be avoiding these things of, of choosing the wrong identity. So, so while our tastes can change, just like our physical tastes can change, uh, we ate a, a couple meals recently at home, and I said, we won't be eating that in Pennsylvania. I mean, how often do you all eat okra and tomatoes? And uh, and so, you know, those things 
uh, you develop tastes for, and, and it changes, and after a while, well, yeah, you like this, uh, this stuff. Well, one of the delicacies in our area is boiled peanuts, and so peanuts in the shell, when they're a little green, instead of roasted peanuts, they're boiled. And, well, they are really good after you learn to like them. Uh, and so uh, that's the same we are affected by those things, but we need to avoid identifying with the wrong people. We need to avoid um, showing out. Now, let's talk about beards and mustaches. And I guess it's a tribute to your generous spirit and security in your own position that you would have a beardless Mennonite speak on the subject of beards and mustaches. And I don't intend to betray your trust. I have no biblical or cultural um, objection to beard wearing. I will just simply say that my own church, um, in my own church, beards, including full beards with a mustache, are optional. And my practice is my personal preference. Um, our church had the position of uh, allowing beards but not the mustache, and about 10 years or so ago, or 15, time moves on, uh, we made the change to allow a full beard, um, that you can have a full beard with a mustache. Specifically, and now this is our church, specifically uh, the beard is to be from ear to ear, if the Lord allows you to do that with a mustache. Um, One historian <clears throat> says that wearing, <clears throat> wearing beards was the common practice of society at the time of the beginning of the Swiss Anabaptist movement. Now, he doesn't give evidence for that, but if uh, I'm assuming he's making a, a judgment call or whatever on whatever evidence he, he said. And so apparently at the time of, in Switzerland, at the time of the beginning of Swiss, of the uh, of the Anabaptist movement, that was the typical thing, except, I think he said, for Catholic, Catholic priests. And again, the presence and the persistence of the Amish beard is an, one indicator that beards were common among Anabaptists. Uh, because uh, if at the time of the Amish division that the uh, Anabaptists were wearing beards and they were the tra traditionalists and they uh, carried forward this practice, there's a good indication that it was a general practice among, among Anabaptists, at least among Swiss Anabaptists. Paintings of some uh, early Anabaptist men, you can go to the, to the uh, Mennonite Encyclopedia. The Mennonite Encyclopedia is now available online. Uh, but if you get the, the bound volumes, the, the uh, hard copies, uh, in the back they have some sheets of, of paintings and, and that. And so if you go to the first volume of the Mennonite Encyclopedia, there's uh, paintings there of, of Anabaptist men. And of course, uh, I don't know how, how true they are, but uh, there's a painting of a, of a Basel Swiss couple from Basel, uh, shows him with a beard and no mustache, a painting of an Anabaptist farmer from the French, Armors, French Farmer's Almanac of 1841, shows him with a beard. And here's what happened. American Mennonites in the East stopped wearing beards perhaps around the beginning of, of the 1800s. Um, and apparently it was, it was a style. It was a fashion. I mean, that was, it was fashionable then at that time to shave off uh, their beards. And so uh, Mennonite men did that. And it seems to be no record of, of controversy on the Mennonite side. Now, I heard a, a brother, uh, th there was a, a brother who's, uh, who's a, is Mennonite and wears a full beard. He's a bishop in, in one of the uh, concerning Mennonite conferences, and he was asked to, to uh, give a presentation at the Calvary Church, at the Fellowship Church, uh, I mean, at the Beecher Church there, on, on the subject of the beard. And I didn't... <laughs> hear him, but I did listen to a recording later, and he made a, 
I made a mention of a controversy in the Amish, and apparently there were some Amish young people who wanted to follow that trend too. And so I, I wrote to him, and I asked him for the reference, and he said, well, the reference came from that, you know that double, uh, Aaron, I think I saw it, or whose house did I see? I saw in one of your houses, maybe. That two-bound volume of, of Amish history that was written uh, fairly recently, it, it, was, it was in there. But on the Mennonite side of things, it appeared not to be a controversial issue to, to start shaving uh, the beards. Uh, however, by the Civil War, then beards became popular again. Do you know that we, we picture Abraham Lincoln with a beard? But Abraham Lincoln didn't wear a beard until after he was elected president. And so I heard a story that some girl, or, uh, some, some girl, I think, told him that he thought he'd, she thought he'd look good in a beard, so he started wearing a beard. Well, that's how we know Abraham Lincoln, as, as having a, a beard. But be that as it may, however, it came came about uh, this thing of starting to wear beards again became controversial among Mennonites, okay? We're saying that in the scope of history, apparently Anabaptists wore beards, but in North America around, or at least Swiss Anabaptists, around the turn of the beginning of the 1800s, they quit wearing beards, Mennonites did. And now we are 60 years later, and it's starting to be fashionable again around the time of the world of Civil War to grow beards. And so now this became controversial among Mennonites that, hey, these people are starting to wear beards. And so I mentioned about the Herald of Truth last night, this um, John Funk out in Goshen, Indiana, Elkhart, Indiana, really, had this, uh, this magazine that, you know, was disseminated among Mennonite people. And so there was this man wrote to the Herald of, in the Herald of Truth, and he said, It has become almost a universal practice among the men of the world to wear a beard, and now that it has become the practice of the world, it also has become the practice of some of the members of our Mennonite churches to grow and wear a beard after the manner of the world. Well, whose manner was it at the beginning of the 1800s when they shaved them off? Um, I wonder... If that argument has been used, even when the beards were not particularly popular, that, well, if you're growing a beard, it's, it's the way of the world. Now, the Midwest scene was different from here in the East. The number of Mennonite leaders who lived in the last half of the 1800s, uh, stretching into the early 1900s, wore beards, and I believe they were influenced by or else came from of the Amish Mennonites. So there were Amish Mennonites in Illinois, and I'm not talking about the sleeping preacher Mennonites, I'm talking about the Amish, the Amish who did not join the old order Amish in the Midwest. And they eventually became assimilated into the Mennonite church, and they became Mennonites, and they lost their identity as Amish. But some of those people still, still wore uh, beards. And so uh, they, they had a little different cultural frame of mind than the Mennonites in the East. So the Mennonites in the East got used to not wearing beards, and so when it became fashionable to wear beards again, they, they had a problem with it. Some of those Mennonites in the West, who apparently had been Amish or influenced by the Amish, they were okay with it. They were, they were wearing beards. Um, <clears throat> so, again, some man by the name of his name starts with a G, and I don't know what his first name was, a Brenneman from Ohio, argued in September 15, 1882 issue of the Herald of Truth that since God had placed a beard on men's faces, it should be worn. Uh, he said that it was sad that, and I quote, many of our dear brethren, especially in the East and Northeast, are bitterly opposed to and despise a beard, if not the wearer himself. And then the Virginia Mennonite Conference addressed the issue in 1884 and said, As custom has adopted so many ways of cutting and shaping the beard and whose ways are constantly changing, we do strongly urge our dear brethren desiring to wear the beard the importance of adopting a plain mode and adhering to that. Well, not all groups were as accommodating 
as that. Some conservative groups have strongly opposed the beard. And Stephen Scott, uh, I, I believe in his book, Why Did They Dress That Way? He addressed uh, a number of, of reasons, lists a number of reasons given of why people oppose the beard. And I, I don't have all those down in my notes. Some of them I did not think had merit, uh, had little merit, or if any. Perhaps the strongest reasons that he listed are that growing a beard, <clears throat> okay, in the context of Mennonites, uh, not Beaches, that growing a beard <clears throat> um, is a departure of their established practice, that it would set a beard wearer apart from the majority of the brethren, and that it is fashionable. <clears throat> of course, you know the arguments for letting for a man letting uh, his beard grow, or at least some of the facial hair to grow. That it's the divine intention, at least for some men. It seems to me that those arguments uh, hold less validity to the degree, <clears throat> okay, bear with me here. Uh, it seems to me that those arguments hold less validity to the degree that the beard is reduced by shaving and close clipping. Now, we have the question is that why is it that some Mennonites are so opposed to the beard? And uh, I think it's particularly, and, and here's the disadvantage of being recorded and, and all that when I'm conjecturing like this, and all, I don't want to offend anybody who might be listening in, but I think it's particularly strong among old order Mennonite groups, whether the old order is, is like team Mennonites or whether it's uh, Weaverland Conference Mennonites, but I think that's, uh, and those groups and people who are, who are, have a lot of membership from that group or influence from those groups, I think that that is stronger in those groups. And so I think what happened, and, and uh, um, I don't have um, Brother Hoover here, uh, you know, Muddy Creek Farm, Hoover, what's his first name? Aim. Uh, uh, I don't have him here to, to contradict me, but I wonder, <clears throat> I wonder if, so Mennonites shaved, and so then it became, you know, they forgot that it was at one time a fashion to shave, it just became standard practice. And so after the passing of time, well, it's like, I mean, you know, we've shaved all the way back to, to Men of Simon, so to speak. You know, it, it became the standard practice. And so to leave that practice then became fashionable. Well, you roll up to the, to the end of the 1900s into the 2000s when, when the old order division happened in the, in the Mennonite church. And so they are the traditionalists. They are the old order Amish, so to speak of the Mennonites, and so they preserved this, they preserved this um, practice of being clean-shaven that it actually, at one time, had been a fashion. But they had forgot that it had been a fashion. You know, we don't, and so that's the advantage of sometimes learning our history. It helps us to see some perspective, you know, uh, that, of, of what's really going on. And so <clears throat> they have hold held more tenaciously onto that because that, in their thinking, is the old practice. And so now to wear a beard is, is uh, you know, something fashionable. That's my theory, okay? I, uh, th that's what, that's what uh, makes sense to me. Now, in general, Moving on to the matter of the mustache. In general, the mustache has been viewed negatively by North American Anabaptists, both uh, Amish and Mennonites. And hearsay attributes it to um, its association with the military. Now, Melvin Gingrich, in his book, uh, The Mennonite Attire Through Four Centuries or whatever it is, you know, he disputes that. But yet, if you go, if you go to... Um, and do a Google search, then you'll show that it, it is found, uh, you know, you'll find some, some uh, uh, support for that. But really, again, in the, in the Mennonite Encyclopedia, 
Uh, I found something here. It said, following the French Revolution, which was at the end of the 1700s, Napoleon's soldiers are said to have worn a mustache without the beard to heighten their appearance of fierceness. Apparently, at that time, the descendants of the Swiss brethren began to wearing, begin wearing the beard without the mustache. And again, from the Mennonite Encyclopedia, it says that Mennonites did not wear the stash, mustache alone. This is talking about the, uh, you know, what you call the old Mennonites. Uh, just, um, we're not talking about Russian Mennonites or Mennonite brethren or, or the general conference Mennonites. Just um, the Mennonites were most associated with did not wear the mustache alone until in the 1950s. Well, so conservative Mennonites still generally, I don't know of any conservative Mennonites that still allow the mustache alone. And so it is entirely possible that there was some uh, connection of the mustache to the military. So if Napoleon soldiers really did wear bushy mustaches or whatever to look fierce, uh, and the Swiss Anabaptists quit wearing mustaches at that time, that there may be some connection with the military. Now, again, this Brenham and Mr. Brenham from Ohio, who wrote in uh, in this article in which he advocated for the beard, he argued for shaving the mustache because it interfered with the use of the common cup in communion and in the observance of the holy kiss. And so then in reply, John C. Kaufman, or John, <clears throat> John S. Kaufman, who was this Virginian who had moved out to Elkhart to work for their for the um, Mennonite Publishing Company, he, he replied, and he was clean-shaven. He was, he was a Mennonite from Virginia. And he said this, from Scripture and according to reason, to cut off the mustache gives liberty to cut off the rest of the beard. So, that was his reason. Now, another piece of trivia, the Southwestern uh, Pennsylvania Conference, now I think it's called Allegheny Conference, ruled in 1935 that the upper lip was to be shaved or closely clipped. And the Virginia Conference had that same standard in its 1953 Rules and Discipline with the explanation that the conference considered the mustache to be a mark of worldliness. I heard my wife's uncle explain on the Southeastern Conference floor um, that the allowance for closely clipped or closely clipped hair on the upper lip was a concession to the tenderness of the lip and the dullness of razors. So maybe it was. Stephen Scott made the observation already toward the end of the 20th century that there's an increasing movement in conservative churches to allow the wearing of the mustache with the beard as a rightful part of the beard but not the mustache alone, and I believe that another two or three decades uh, have, have, have justified that. Uh, you yourselves know uh, probably that some conservative groups here in Lancaster County are allowing uh, mustaches with a full beard that, that conservative Mennonite groups said in the past did not. Well, I think I better keep moving. And so just consider yourselves to have stood and sat back down and sang a song, and we're going to continue on. We're going into women's hairstyles, and uh, you know maybe this is even more treacherous. Go ahead and stand on up. Maybe this is even more treacherous in its own way than talking about men's hair, uh, facial hair. But um, anyway, you can be seated whenever you like. Like men's hairstyling, women's hairstyles, at least in conservative circles, seem to be influenced by fads. Now, maybe you are exempt from that. But in Mennonite circles, they are not. We are not. As an example, uh, Mennonite women's hairstyling of, of how they changed, my mother, who was born in 1930, uh, wore her hair bun low on the back of her head. And then uh, a fad in my later teens, affecting some of my contemporaries, placed a bun at the crown of the head with the covering perched on top. Pull back some old Lancaster, uh, Lancaster Mennonite school yearbook, and you might you might see that. It kind of had a uh, a cap on top, and that was uh, I saw that in in conservative conference uh, girls, uh, I believe. 
More recently, some place the bun as a ball on the back of the head while others flatten it out, and it seems that my mother's low placement is coming back. Now, since in contrast to general society, conservative Anabaptist women wear their hair long and put it up, you wonder, well, where do these new styles come from? Um, it's not like the styles for men's hair that comes from general society. So there's something happening within, within the dynamic of conservative Mennonite women that somebody is uh, decide, is a trendsetter or, or some bodies or something. So, you know, that, how does that, that start? But whatever the origin, winter Bible schools might be the place to find out what's cutting edge in, uh, in women's hairstyles. One writer said that much admonition is given against showing pride in one's hair. Despite these efforts, hair is often waved, curled, fluffed, and combed down on the forehead. The covering is slid back to reveal a female's carefully arranged tresses. Now, whether or not women in, in general society cut their hair... Uh, before the 20th century, they generally wore it long. Okay, maybe it wasn't uncut. Uh, we, we lived in Puerto Rico a number of years, and there was a Pentecostal denomination there that was a fairly conservative Pentecostal denomination, and those ladies were to have long hair. It was not uncut hair, but it was long hair. And I'm saying that, that you know, perhaps there were women in North American society before the 20th century who had cut their hair some, but it was still relatively long. Uh, it was only around uh, the 1920s that women began to cut their hair very short, and it was considered scandalous uh, by some people in society. Never. Uh, nevertheless, even before the 1920s, women were capable of extravagant hairdos. And, and you can go back into the Greek. And, but that's what Peter and Paul were talking about, probably, because there were extravagant hairdos uh, back in Greek society. And so uh, they were talking about this in, in the epistles, about not having these extravagant hairdos. Now, there are paintings from what is known as the Dutch... Uh, Mennonite Golden Age, and that was about 200 years from 1535 to seven, uh, 1740. And they typically picture the women with their hair tightly combed back, put up, and covered with a large head covering. Uh, there's old pictures of American, American Mennonite women who were likely church members and typically showed them with their, with their hair parted in the middle, it was combed flat, and had a sizable head covering. And Melvin Gingrich, again, supposes that this conservative way of doing hair must have been maintained by tradition without the benefit of church rules and regulations. And get this, for less is said about women's hairstyles than about men's beards and mustaches. So either the beard and mustache issue was really a hot issue or the women were doing a good job of, of, uh, of simplicity in, in their hair arrangement. But then... Uh, again, around the turn of the 20th century, some church statements were forthcoming, and it might have been that ladies were feeling uh, more pressure to, to be fashionable, and it might also reflect the increased emphasis on, on promoting plain dress that was during that time. And so one of those statements coming from uh, the Mennonite General Conference in 1913 asked for hair combed modestly so that the devotional covering may be worn with decency and order. And then the uh, uh, Missouri-Iowa conference in 1915 said that the display of hair was not to be tolerated. And then four years later, it said that puffed, curled, or disheveled hair for sisters was unbecoming. And I, I, I took note of that disheveled hair because occasionally you see uh, a, a sister, and, and I'm, not I'm not looking at anybody carefully, maybe there's nobody like this hair, but it looks like their hair just really was not combed well. It's disheveled, you know? Well, that's as old as the, as the early, um, as, as uh, when? 1915. So this is nothing, it's nothing new. It seems to me that in terms of present practice that Christian ladies ought to be as sensitive to the apparent teaching 
in Peter and Timothy regarding elaborate, elaborate uh, hairdos. So while some people take the prohibition against plaiting or braiding of the hair literally, uh, in Mennonite circles, it seems that that is not normally uh, taken as a prohibition against a simple braid to keep uh, a girl's hair from just scattering all over the place. Rather, it uh, has to do with, with a prohibition to be elaborate, to be ornamental, to be styling it in a look-at-me sort of a way, to be uh, intertwining. Uh, and so it's talking about uh, elaborate hairdos. And that's, that's the way apparently many people understand that to be. I do have a problem, nonetheless, with young ladies and older ones to, to, uh, to use a braid just as a matter of, of, a, as a, of an accent point uh, that, you know, and especially like, you know, for special occasions that you normally comb your hair simply and all, and, and then, okay, well, and so you use a braid or something, and again, I'm not picking on anyone here, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't looked, uh, but to, to just use that as, a, as an accent point to, to, to me, it seems to be in violation of the principle of Timothy and, and Peter. Now, I'm about to conclude what I have to say about women's hairstyles, and I don't want to be misunderstood. What I'm about to say, I'm saying part serious and part for fun, okay? I'm not out to advocate for a shift, and of course, as a man, I'm not as heavily invested in caring for my hair as you, as you sisters are. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm concerned, that even though I am a man, I am, you know, to take a little interest in how I comb my hair and how it's cut. And I know that you sisters are interested in, in how you appear as well. But nevertheless, I do wonder if God ever intended that Christian women's hairdressing be as involved and uh, need to be so skilled and as complicated as it's become. And with all you know, the hairpins and the hairspray and, and everything. And then, you know, sometimes and it hurts and you got to adjust it and, and, and all that. I mean, I've been married for a while. And, and so I, I know, you know, what my wife goes through. And I know sometimes, you know, after a while of, of, of trying to hang your hair, your hair bun or whatever, and so it can pull hair out and you can become bald. Is that really what, what God intended? I'm saying this half serious, but I also want you to know that I'm having fun. And so a, tip, a painting of a typical Swiss Mennonite of the 18th century shows her at the spinning wheel wearing a large black head covering tied under her chin with a protruding braid resting on her back. Now again, I'm not advocating for a change that few women would want to embrace at this point anyway. You're used to that highly skilled look. But might there have been a more simple and comfortable way for women to arrange their hair that, had it been taken, would seem normal and attractive today? That wouldn't have been so complicated and difficult. But anyway, here we are. That isn't what happened. Now, just to close, I want to take a little, just a little broader perspective here, and I'll try to do this quickly. But quite some years ago, a mature age couple of some notable vocational achievement and social standing became members of our church in, in South Carolina. And this couple of deep-rooted Southerners, uh, they were Christians. They had long time been associated with South Carolina Mennonites, and uh, they were part of a dominant Southern Protestant denomination. But although... Uh, the gentleman started wearing uh, a plain coat. It was the lady, of course, who exhibited the most change as they became members of, of our church uh, and, and putting on uh, you know, her clothing and her hairstyling, and, and she was given to jewelry, and, and uh, so it was a lot, of, a lot of change. Now, this man is now is aged. Uh, he's, he'll soon turn 90 years old, and he and his wife are still living, and he is still a member of our church. She is not. She lasted only a short while. And as I recall, she said it was because that she was not comfortable with Mennonite culture. 
Now, if a Mennonite culture, she meant that, you know, we as Mennonites were just kind of crude and weren't as, as uh, refined as what Southerners are and as gracious, well, then, then, you know, we ought to be rebuked. And I know sometimes we did kind of offend her. Uh, she has been kind of offended by not as polite a culture as would have been nice. But I don't think that's what she had in mind. When she was talking about this uh, Mennonite culture, it was more had to do with hair arrangement and jewelry and cosmetics and hair covering and uh, he uh, head covering and, and cape dress. And so my question to you is whether these things and the practices that we've looked at in this study are primarily cultural. They just uh, reflect the trappings that, you know, we're Swiss, Swiss uh, people and Anabaptists and that, that's just our culture and, and so that's, that's who we are and that's, that's what we do and they really don't apply too well to African Americans or to Latins or to Asians or, or even to American whites. They just kind of apply for, you know, for Mennonite people. Are they kind of like, you know, your tonsils or your appendix that, you know, we can do without and really don't do that terrible much harm? They're just legalisms that kind of encumber us, but they're weights that, that we could remove and we really ought to remove so that we can be freer in Christ and, and they're just kind of barriers to evangelism. Are they just kind of cultural things like that? Well, the questions I raised, you know, we can't just answer by, by one word. Uh, but we've been talking about some selected Anabaptist Mennonite applications. And so these things really are based on principles. I said that an application is an appropriate response to God-given truth. And so the degree that the application is based on a biblical principle, the practice is not just some cultural quirk. It's not just some... Something well, that's just the way we do. We're doing this way because it's an it's it's a response we understand would be pleasing to God because of what God teaches in His Word, a, a principle. At the same time, the form or nature of the application may very well reflect the cultural situation in which the application is given. Like I mentioned, you all probably don't eat okra. Well, we do. Why? Because we live in the deep in the South, and, and you don't. And so there's, there's, there's a difference on the food we eat. And so where we live, where our background is, may make some difference in the application that we make. So thinking about uh, our sisters wearing head coverings, well, why do they do that? So I'd like to read just two verses in Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 says this, After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you dwelt, you shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, you shall not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall do my, my judgments and keep my ordinances, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Now what do you call what you do? You call it your culture, okay? And so he said, God said, do not just go and embrace the culture of the Egyptians. Don't do like the Egyptians. Do like I command you to do. And so the Egyptians had a culture, and the Israelites had a culture. To the degree that they followed God's commandments, their culture was somewhat different than the Egyptians. Well, of course, they ate the leeks and the garlics of Egypt, but they were not to, and when they went to Canaan, you know, they were not to do like the Canaanites. They could eat the food there, but, but the way they did was different. And so wearing a head covering is, yes, it's a part of our culture. We are countercultural. We our culture is is influenced by us putting to practice the commandments of God. Do you know that not wearing a head covering and cutting your hair as women is a culture too? It's a North American culture. That's cultural as well. That's how they do. Whether it's for ignorance or whether it's 
because of indoctrination or whether it's because of rebellion or whether it's just because of unbelief or whatever, wearing a covering is a cultural thing, not wearing a covering is a cultural thing. That's how we do. And why do we do that way? Well, let's not let anybody take us on a ride about culture and say, well, that's just your culture. You know, y'all just wear head coverings and we're using that as an example. Well, yeah, it's our, part of our culture because we are trying to do what God would have us to do. But guess what? You not wearing a head covering is a part of your culture and we are to be uh, mold our culture after Christ, after the teaching of Scripture. Everyone has a culture. Being a believer and a disciple of Jesus makes us countercultural to the degree that the culture in which we lived is depraved. And so that doesn't mean that the more depraved the culture, the more severe our applications are peculiar they need to be. Rather, it means that wholesome Christian practice and conduct will stand in greater contrast to the world's depravity. The more depraved the world becomes, the greater the dark, the greater the contrast between Christian culture and non-Christian culture. So let me close with these words from Philippians. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights of the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you that we can be delivered from the depraved nature of, of culture, the depraved practices of the people who live around us, and you give us direction on how to form our behavior, the things that we do, the culture that is developed from that in a sane and sensible way, in a way that is good for us and reflects your holiness and your wisdom. So help us to be willing to be as different as following Christ makes us to be and not to chafe under that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I believe we're to sing a song.